Tragedy from the Greek, tragoidia, tragoidia, is a form of drama based on human suffering that invokes an accompanying catharsis or pleasure in audiences. While many cultures have developed forms that provoke this paradoxical response, the term tragedy often refers to a specific tradition of drama that has played a unique and important role historically in the self-definition of Western civilization. That tradition has been multiple and discontinuous, yet the term has often been used to invoke a powerful effect of cultural identity and historical continuity. The Greeks and the Elizabethans, in one cultural form, Hellenes and Christians, in a common activity. As Raymond Williams puts it, from its origins in the theatre of ancient Greece 2,500 years ago, from which there survives only a fraction of the work of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, as well as a large number of fragments from other poets, through its singular articulations in the works of Shakespeare, Lope de Vega, Jean Racine, and Friedrich Schiller to the more recent naturalistic tragedy of August Strindberg, Samuel Beckett's modernist meditations on death, loss and suffering, Muller's postmodernist reworkings of the tragic canon, and Joshua to Oppenheimer's incorporation of tragic pathos in his non-fiction film, The Act of Killing 2012, tragedy has remained an important site of cultural experimentation, negotiation, struggle, and change. A long line of philosophers—which includes Plato, Aristotle, Saint Augustine, Voltaire, Hume, Diderot, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Freud, Benjamin, Camus, Lacan, and Deleuze, have analyzed, speculated upon, and criticized the genre. In the wake of Aristotle's Poetics 335 BCE, tragedy has been used to make genre distinctions, whether at the scale of poetry in general, where the tragic divides against epic and lyric, or at the scale of the drama, where tragedy is opposed to comedy. In the modern era, tragedy has also been defined against drama, melodrama, the tragicomic, and epic theater. Drama, in the narrow sense, cuts across the traditional division between comedy and tragedy in an anti or a generic deterritorialization from the mid 19th century onwards. Both Bertolt Brecht and Augusto Boal define their epic theater projects non Aristotelian drama and theater of the oppressed, respectively, against models of tragedy. Taxidou, however, reads epic theater as an incorporation of tragic functions and its treatments of mourning and speculation. Topic. Origin The word, tragedy, appears to have been used to describe different phenomena at different times. It derives from classical Greek tragoidia, contracted from trag o aodia. Topic. Goat song, which comes from tragos. He goat. And Aidin equals to sing. Cf. Ode. Scholars suspect this may be traced to a time when a goat was either the prize in a competition of choral dancing or was that around which a chorus danced prior to the animal's ritual sacrifice. In another view on the etymology, Athenaeus of Nocratus, second third century CE, says that the original form of the word was trigodia from trigos, grape harvest, and ode, song, because those events were first introduced during grape harvest, writing in 335 BCE, long after the golden age of fifth century Athenian tragedy. Aristotle provides the earliest surviving explanation for the origin of the dramatic art form in his Poetics, in which he argues that tragedy developed from the improvisations of the leader of choral dithyrambs, him sung and danced in praise of Dionysus, the god of wine and fertility. Anyway, arising from an improvisatory beginning both tragedy and comedy. Tragedy from the leaders of the dithyram, and comedy from the leaders of the phallic processions which even now continue as a custom in many of our cities. Tragedy grew little by little, as the poets developed whatever new part of it had appeared, and, passing through many changes, tragedy came to a halt, since it had attained its own nature. In the same work, Aristotle attempts to provide a scholastic definition of what tragedy is. Tragedy is, then, an enactment of a deed that is important and complete, and of a certain magnitude, by means of language enriched with ornaments, each used separately in the different parts of the play, it is enacted, not merely recited, and through pity and fear it affects relief catharsis to such and similar emotions. There is some dissent to the dithyrambic origins of tragedy, mostly based on the differences between the shapes of their choruses and styles of dancing. A common dissent from pre-Hellenic fertility and burial rites has been suggested. Friedrich Nietzsche discussed the origins of Greek tragedy in his early book The Birth of Tragedy 1872. 
Here, he suggests the name originates in the use of a chorus of goat-like satyrs in the original dithyrams from which the tragic genre developed. Scott Scullion writes, there is abundant evidence for tragoidia understood as song for the prize goat. The best known evidence is Horace, A. R.'s Poetica 220-24, he who with a tragic song competed for a mere goat. The earliest is the Parian Marble, a chronicle inscribed about 264 63 BCE, which records, under a date between 538 and 528 BCE, Thespis is the poet first produced and as prize was established the billy goat. Fergus 239a, Epic 43, the clearest is Eustathius 1769.45. They called those competing tragedians, clearly because of the song over the billy goat. <inaudible> Greek Athenian tragedy—the oldest surviving form of tragedy—is a type of dance drama that formed an important part of the theatrical culture of the city-state. Having emerged sometime during the 6th century BCE, it flowered during the 5th century BCE from the end of which it began to spread throughout the Greek world, and continued to be popular until the beginning of the Hellenistic period. No tragedies from the 6th century and only 32 of the more than a thousand that were performed in the 5th century have survived. We have complete texts extant by Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. Athenian tragedies were performed in late March, early April at an annual state religious festival in honor of Dionysus. The presentations took the form of a contest between three playwrights, who presented their works on three successive days. Each playwright offered a tetralogy consisting of three tragedies and a concluding comic piece called a satyr play. The four plays sometimes featured linked stories. Only one complete trilogy of tragedies has survived, the Orestia of Aeschylus. The Greek theatre was in the open air, on the side of a hill, and performances of a trilogy and satyr play probably lasted most of the day. Performances were apparently open to all citizens, including women, but evidence is scant. The theatre of Dionysus at Athens probably held around 12,000 people, all of the choral parts were sung to the accompaniment of an aulus, and some of the actors' answers to the chorus were sung as well. The play as a whole was composed in various verse meters. All actors were male and wore masks. A Greek chorus danced as well as sang, though no one knows exactly what sorts of steps the chorus performed as it sang. Choral songs in tragedy are often divided into three sections, strophe, turning, circling, antistrophe, counter-turning, counter-circling, and epode, after song. Many ancient Greek tragedians employed the ekiklima as a theatrical device, which was a platform hidden behind the scene that could be rolled out to display the aftermath of some event which had happened out of sight of the audience. This event was frequently a brutal murder of some sort, an act of violence which could not be effectively portrayed visually, but an action of which the other characters must see the effects in order for it to have meaning and emotional resonance. A prime example of the use of the ekiklima is after the murder of Agamemnon in the first play of Aeschylus Orestia, when the king's butchered body is wheeled out in a grand display for all to see. Variations on the ekiklima are used in tragedies and other forms to this day, as writers still find it a useful and often powerful device for showing the consequences of extreme human actions. Another such device was a crane, the mechan, which served to hoist a god or goddess on stage when they were supposed to arrive flying. This device gave origin to the phrase, Deus ex machina, God out of a machine, that is, the surprise intervention of an unforeseen external factor that changes the outcome of an event. <laughs> Roman Following the expansion of the Roman Republic 509 BCE into several Greek territories between 270–240 BCE, Rome encountered Greek tragedy. From the later years of the Republic and by means of the Roman Empire 27 BCE to 476 CE, theatre spread west across Europe, around the Mediterranean and even reached England. While Greek tragedy continued to be performed throughout the Roman period, the year 240 BCE marks the beginning of regular Roman drama. Livius Andronicus began to write Roman tragedies, thus creating some of the first important works of Roman literature. 
Five years later, Gnaeus Navius also began to write tragedies though he was more appreciated for his comedies. No complete early Roman tragedy survives, though it was highly regarded in its day. Historians know of three other early tragic playwrights Quintus Ennius, Marcus Pacuvius, and Lucius Accius. From the time of the Empire, the tragedies of two playwrights survive one is an unknown author, while the other is the Stoic philosopher Seneca. Nine of Seneca's tragedies survive, all of which are fabula crepidata, tragedies adapted from Greek originals. His Phaedra, for example, was based on Euripides Hippolytus. Historians do not know who wrote the only extant example of the fabula pretexta tragedies based on Roman subjects, Octavia, but in former times it was mistakenly attributed to Seneca due to his appearance as a character in the tragedy. Seneca's tragedies rework those of all three of the Athenian tragic playwrights whose work has survived. Probably meant to be recited at elite gatherings, they differ from the Greek versions in their long declamatory, narrative accounts of action, their obtrusive moralizing, and their bombastic rhetoric. They dwell on detailed accounts of horrible deeds and contain long reflective soliloquies. Though the gods rarely appear in these plays, ghosts and witches abound. Senecan tragedies explore ideas of revenge, the occult, the supernatural, suicide, blood and gore. The Renaissance scholar Julius Caesar Scaliger (1484–1558), who knew both Latin and Greek, preferred Seneca to Euripides. Renaissance Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Influence of Greek and Roman Classical Greek drama was largely forgotten in Western Europe from the Middle Ages to the beginning of the 16th century. Medieval theatre was dominated by mystery plays, morality plays, farces and miracle plays. In Italy, the models for tragedy in the later Middle Ages were Roman, particularly the works of Seneca, interest in which was reawakened by the Paduan Lovato de Lovati (1241–1309). His pupil Albertino Masato (1261–1329), also of Padua, in 1315 wrote the Latin verse tragedy Echerines, which uses the story of the tyrant Azelino III da Romano to highlight the danger to Padua posed by Cangrande della Scala of Verona. It was the first secular tragedy written since Roman times, and may be considered the first Italian tragedy identifiable as a Renaissance work. The earliest tragedies to employ purely classical themes are the Achilles written before 1390 by Antonio Loschi of Vicenza c. and the Prawn of the Venetian Gregorio Correr which dates from 1428–29, in 1515 Gian Giorgio Trissino of Vicenza wrote his tragedy Sophonisba in the vernacular that would later be called Italian. Drawn from Livy's account of Sophonisba, the Carthaginian princess who drank poison to avoid being taken by the Romans, it adheres closely to classical rules. It was soon followed by the Orest and Rosmunda of Trissino's friend, the Florentine Giovanni di Bernardo Riccelli both were completed by early 1516 and are based on classical Greek models, Rosmunda on the Hecuba of Euripides, and Orest on the Iphigenia in Tories of the same author. Like Sophonisba, they are in Italian and in blank unrhymed hendecasyllables. Another of the first of all modern tragedies is A Castro, by Portuguese poet and playwright Antonio Ferreira, written around 1550 but only published in 1587 in polymetric verse most of it being blank hendecasyllables, dealing with the murder of Inés de Castro, one of the most dramatic episodes in Portuguese history. Although these three Italian plays are often cited, separately or together, as being the first regular tragedies in modern times, as well as the earliest substantial works to be written in blank hendecasyllables, they were apparently preceded by two other works in the vernacular, Pamphila or Philostrato e Pamphila written in 1498 or 1508 by Antonio Camelli Antonio da Pistoia, and a Sophonisba by Galeato del Coreto of 1502, from about 1500 printed copies, in the original languages, of the works of Sophocles, Seneca, and Euripides, as well as comedic writers such as Aristophanes, Terence and Plautus, were available in Europe and the next forty years saw humanists and poets translating and adapting their tragedies. In the 1540s, the European university setting and especially, from 1553 on, the Jesuit colleges became host to a Neo-Latin theatre written by scholars. 
The influence of Seneca was particularly strong in its humanist tragedy. His plays, with their ghosts, lyrical passages and rhetorical oratory, brought a concentration on rhetoric and language over dramatic action to many humanist tragedies. The most important sources for French tragic theatre in the Renaissance were the example of Seneca and the precepts of Horace and Aristotle and contemporary commentaries by Julius Caesar Scaliger and Lodovico Castelvetro, although plots were taken from classical authors such as Plutarch, Suetonius, etc., from the Bible, from contemporary events and from short story collections Italian, French and Spanish. The Greek tragic authors Sophocles and Euripides would become increasingly important as models by the middle of the 17th century. Important models were also supplied by the Spanish Golden Age playwrights Pedro Calderón de la Barca, Terso de Molina and Lope de Vega, many of whose works were translated and adapted for the French stage. Britain The common forms are the Tragedy of circumstance, people are born into their situations, and do not choose them, such tragedies explore the consequences of birthrights, particularly for monarchs Tragedy of miscalculation, the protagonist's error of judgment has tragic consequences Revenge play in English, the most famous and most successful tragedies are those of William Shakespeare and his Elizabethan contemporaries. Shakespeare's tragedies include Antony and Cleopatra Coriolanus Hamlet Julius Caesar King Lear Macbeth Othello Romeo and Juliet Timon of Athens Titus Andronicus Troilus and Cressida contemporary of Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, also wrote examples of tragedy in English, notably The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus Tamburlaine the Great John Webster 1580 also wrote famous plays of the genre The Duchess of Malfi The White Devil Topic <inaudible> Opera Contemporary with Shakespeare an entirely different approach to facilitating the rebirth of tragedy was taken in Italy Jacopo Perry in the preface to his Eurydice refers to the ancient Greeks and Romans who in the opinion of many sang their staged tragedies throughout in representing them on stage." The attempts of Perry and his contemporaries to recreate ancient tragedy gave rise to the new Italian musical genre of opera. In France, tragic operatic works from the time of Lully to about that of Gluck were not called opera, but tragedie en musique tragedy in music", or some similar name, the tragedie en musique is regarded as a distinct musical genre. Some later operatic composers have also shared Perry's aims, Richard Wagner's concept of Gesamtkunstwerk, integrated work of art, for example, was intended as a return to the ideal of Greek tragedy in which all the arts were blended in service of the drama. Nietzsche, in his The Birth of Tragedy 1872, was to support Wagner in his claims to be a successor of the ancient dramatists. Neoclassical. For much of the 17th century, Pierre Cornet, who made his mark on the world of tragedy with plays like Médé 1635 and Le Cid 1636, was the most successful writer of French tragedies. Cornet's tragedies were strangely untragic his first version of Le Cid was even listed as a tragicomedy, for they had happy endings. In his theoretical works on theatre, Cornet redefined both comedy and tragedy around the following suppositions. The stage in both comedy and tragedy, should feature noble characters this would eliminate many low characters, typical of the farce, from Corneille's comedies. Noble characters should not be depicted as vile reprehensible actions are generally due to non-noble characters in Corneille's plays. Tragedy deals with affairs of the state wars, dynastic marriages, comedy deals with love. For a work to be tragic, it need not have a tragic ending. Although Aristotle says that catharsis purgation of emotion should be the goal of tragedy, this is only an ideal. In conformity with the moral codes of the period, plays should not show evil being rewarded or nobility being degraded. Corneille continued to write plays through 1674, mainly tragedies, but also something he called heroic comedies, and many continued to be successes, although the irregularities 
of his theatrical methods were increasingly criticized notably by François Edelin, Abbé d'Aubignac and the success of Jean Racine from the late 1660s signaled the end of his preeminence. Jean Racine's tragedies—inspired by Greek myths, Euripides, Sophocles and Seneca, condensed their plot into a tight set of passionate and duty-bound conflicts between a small group of noble characters, and concentrated on these characters' double binds and the geometry of their unfulfilled desires and hatreds. Racine's poetic skill was in the representation of pathos and amorous passion like Fedre's love for her stepson and his impact was such that emotional crisis would be the dominant mode of tragedy to the end of the century. Racine's two late plays, Esther and Athelie, opened new doors to biblical subject matter and to the use of theater in the education of young women. Racine also faced criticism for his irregularities. When his play, Berenice, was criticized for not containing any deaths, Racine disputed the conventional view of tragedy. For more on French tragedy of the 16th and 17th centuries, see French Renaissance literature and French literature of the 17th century. Bourgeois Bourgeois tragedy German, Trauerspiel, is a form that developed in 18th-century Europe. It was a fruit of the Enlightenment and the emergence of the bourgeois class and its ideals. It is characterized by the fact that its protagonists are ordinary citizens. The first true bourgeois tragedy was an English play, George Lillo's The London Merchant, or, The History of George Barnwell, which was first performed in 1731. Usually, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing's play Miss Sarah Sampson, which was first produced in 1755, is said to be the earliest Burgerliches Trauerspiel in Germany. <laughs> Modern development In modernist literature, the definition of tragedy has become less precise. The most fundamental change has been the rejection of Aristotle's dictum that true tragedy can only depict those with power and high status. Arthur Miller's essay, Tragedy and the Common Man, 1949, argues that tragedy may also depict ordinary people in domestic surroundings. British playwright Howard Barker has argued strenuously for the rebirth of tragedy in the contemporary theatre, most notably in his volume Arguments for a Theatre. You emerge from tragedy equipped against lies. After the musical, you're anybody's fool. He insists. Critics such as George Steiner have even been prepared to argue that tragedy may no longer exist in comparison with its former manifestations in classical antiquity. In The Death of Tragedy 1961, George Steiner outlined the characteristics of Greek tragedy and the traditions that developed from that period. In the foreword 1980 to a new edition of his book Steiner concluded that the dramas of Shakespeare are not a renaissance of or a humanistic variant of the absolute tragic model. They are, rather, a rejection of this model in the light of tragicomic and realistic criteria. In part, this feature of Shakespeare's mind is explained by his bent of mind or imagination, which was so encompassing, so receptive to the plurality of diverse orders of experience. When compared to the drama of Greek antiquity and French classicism, Shakespeare's forms are richer but hybrid. Topic: Theories. Topic. Aristotle Aristotle wrote in his work Poetics that Tragedy is characterized by seriousness and involves a great person who experiences a reversal of fortune Aristotle's definition can include a change of fortune from bad to good as in the Eumenides, but he says that the change from good to bad as in Oedipus Rex is preferable because this induces pity and fear within the spectators. Tragedy results in a catharsis emotional cleansing or healing for the audience through their experience of these emotions in response to the suffering of the characters in the drama. According to Aristotle, "...the structure of the best tragedy should not be simple but complex and one that represents incidents arousing fear and pity—for that is peculiar to this form of art." This reversal of fortune must be caused by the tragic hero's hamartia, which is often translated as either a character flaw, or as a mistake since the original Greek etymology traces back to hamartinian, a sporting term that refers to an archer or spear thrower missing his target. According to Aristotle, 
The misfortune is brought about not by general vice or depravity, but by some particular error or frailty. The reversal is the inevitable but unforeseen result of some action taken by the hero. It is also a misconception that this reversal can be brought about by a higher power e.g. the law, the gods, fate, or society, but if a character's downfall is brought about by an external cause, Aristotle describes this as a misadventure and not a tragedy. In addition, the tragic hero may achieve some revelation or recognition and ignorances, knowing again, or knowing back, or knowing throughout, about human fate, destiny, and the will of the gods. Aristotle terms this sort of recognition, a change from ignorance to awareness of a bond of love or hate. In Poetics, Aristotle gave the following definition in ancient Greek of the word, tragedy, tragoidea, estenoun tragoidea mimesis praxeos spaudeus chi teleis megathos ekhauses hedismenoi logoi choris hekastoi tun iden en twa moriwa dronten chi o dia pongelius dleo chi phobu paranusa ten tun toyaden pathematen catharsin, which means tragedy is an imitation of an action that is admirable, complete, composed of an introduction, a middle part, and an ending, and possesses magnitude, in language made pleasurable, each of its species separated in different parts, performed by actors, not through narration, affecting through pity and fear the purification of such emotions. Common usage of tragedy refers to any story with a sad ending, whereas to be an Aristotelian tragedy, the story must fit the set of requirements as laid out by poetics. By this definition social drama cannot be tragic because the hero in it is a victim of circumstance and incidents that depend upon the society in which he lives and not upon the inner compulsions—psychological or religious—which determine his progress towards self-knowledge and death. Exactly what constitutes a «tragedy», however, is a frequently debated matter. According to Aristotle, there are four species of tragedy. One. Complex, which involves peripety and discovery. 2. Suffering, tragedies of such nature can be seen in the Greek mythological stories of Ajaxes and Ixions. 3. Character, a tragedy of moral or ethical character. Tragedies of this nature can be found in Theotides and Peleus. 4. Spectacle, that of a horror-like theme. Examples of this nature are Forsides and Prometheus. Hegel G. W. F. Hegel, the German philosopher most famous for his dialectical approach to epistemology and history, also applied such a methodology to his theory of tragedy. In his essay, Hegel's Theory of Tragedy, A. C. Bradley first introduced the English-speaking world to Hegel's theory, which Bradley called the tragic collision, and contrasted against the Aristotelian notions of the tragic hero, and his or her hamartia, in subsequent analyses of the Aeschylus Orestia trilogy and of Sophocles' Antigone. Hegel himself, however, in his seminal, The Phenomenology of Spirit, argues for a more complicated theory of tragedy, with two complementary branches which, though driven by a single dialectical principle, differentiate Greek tragedy from that which follows Shakespeare. His later lectures formulate such a theory of tragedy as a conflict of ethical forces, represented by characters, in ancient Greek tragedy, but in Shakespearean tragedy the conflict is rendered as one of subject and object, of individual personality which must manifest self-destructive passions because only such passions are strong enough to defend the individual from a hostile and capricious external world. The heroes of ancient classical tragedy encounter situations in which, if they firmly decide in favor of the one ethical pathos that alone suits their finished character, they must necessarily come into conflict with the equally justified ethical power that confronts them. Modern characters, on the other hand, stand in a wealth of more accidental circumstances, within which one could act this way or that, so that the conflict is, though occasioned by external preconditions, still essentially grounded in the character. The new individuals, in their passions, obey their own nature simply because they are what they are. Greek heroes also act in accordance with individuality, but in ancient tragedy such individuality is necessarily a self-contained ethical pathos. In modern tragedy, however, the character in its peculiarity decides in accordance with subjective desires such that congruity of character with outward ethical aim no longer constitutes an essential basis of tragic beauty. 
Hegel's comments on a particular play may better elucidate his theory. Viewed externally, Hamlet's death may be seen to have been brought about accidentally. But in Hamlet's soul, we understand that death has lurked from the beginning. The sandbank of finitude cannot suffice his sorrow and tenderness, such grief and nausea at all conditions of life. We feel he is a man whom inner disgust has almost consumed well before death comes upon him from outside. Similar dramatic forms in world theatre <inaudible> Ancient Indian drama The writer Bharata Muni, in his work on dramatic theory A Treatise on Theatre Sanskrit, Natyasastra, Natyasastra c. 200 BCE to 200 CE identified several rases such as pity, anger, disgust and terror in the emotional responses of audiences for the Sanskrit drama of ancient India. The text also suggests the notion of musical modes or jatis which are the origin of the notion of the modern melodic structures known as ragas. Their role in invoking emotions are emphasized thus compositions emphasizing the notes gandhara or rishaba are said to provoke sadness or pathos. Karuna rasa whereas Rishaba evokes heroism Vira rasa. Jatis are elaborated in greater detail in the text De Tilam, composed around the same time as the treatise. The celebrated ancient Indian epic, Mahabharata, can also be related to tragedy in some ways. According to Hermann Oldenburg, the original epic once carried an immense, tragic force. It was common in Sanskrit drama to adapt episodes from the Mahabharata into dramatic form. See also Classicism Tragedies en musique She tragedy Notes <laughs>